Shinji and Warhammer 40k. Chapter 48. The Last Love Song. Part 2b. Boom! They could feel everything shake, even buried so far deep underground. Tokyo 3 had already been mostly evacuated, except for critical crew and several exemptions. It was a strange thing to acknowledge that the most dangerous place in the world could also be the safest place in the world. Foom! Bits of plaster fell from the ceiling. The shelters were all brightly lit, and the people crowded within could see each other's faces, all their fears and worries laid bare, their despair and regrets. Under Gendo Akari's tenure, Nerve was a place of ominous shadows and amber-lit corridors, but Katsuragi's Nerve promised openness and light. That was possibly a mistake, for sometimes darkness and ignorance were comforting. Foom! The original excuse used for building Tokyo Free and what had been the tourist area of, of Hakone Valley region was that it was supposed to be the new administrative capital of all Japan. Unlike the ad hoc Tokyo 2, built on what used to be Matsumoto City in Nagano Prefecture after the original Tokyo was destroyed by an atomic bomb in the wars following Second Impact, Nagano was too far inland, while Hakone opened down into the coastline of what had been. Due to being surrounded by mountains, Tokyo 3 could be locked tight unlike any other city. Katsuragi's Tokyo 3 was a fortress, a treasure box. While most of the native Japanese civilians had evacuated out to the surrounding cities, Nerve hurriedly called for more workers and fighters from its other branches and the UN. There had to be enough people inside the geofront to restart the human race if necessary. Ironically, this was the very same reason why people decided to build the Earth's Cradle, and why Nagisa decided to seize it. Coming here was a mistake, thought Sophia Av Avricopolis. Out there, we had no protection against people who would kidnap or use our families as pawns. We had no protection against death from the sky. But this place. All the boy did was offer us the choice to how we die. She didn't dare voice out her thoughts. She had her five-year-old son in her arms. Her son looked up and solemnly swear said, Don't worry, mother. The island of Akari will protect us. Sophia could only grimace and hugged him tight. Silently, she screamed, your father died for that boy. That boy. This city. What more will you take from me? Foom! For if dreams could come true, then certainly so could nightmares. And from the speakers, a female voice announced with completely forced calm. Attention! Attention! Everyone, please head to the nearest designated safe zone. This is not a drill. Please make sure you are in a designated safe area, free of things that can become dangerous flying debris. This is the final countdown. This is the final countdown. Hans in Grand Wolfenbach ducked as the shock rave passed. The troops were halfway up Mount Osama and had a clear view straight to the rest into Oldorara and Sagami through the old Takedo Road. It was a natural valley choke point of strategic importance for centuries. It was also cramped fighting grounds for Evangelians. It was the perfect duel grounds for these two. He thought it was just so terribly a waste how all their digging and fortifications were useless. He was somewhat proud of having helped dig out the trenches. Now what they did was to offer safish observation of two man-made gods battling it out with no concern for whatever they smash in the way. Unit 2 had a hammer. Lilith 1 had four limbs, the upper pair ending in large rending claws, and the lower ones now holding short serrated bone daggers. Unit 2 found itself being forced to give ground, but for every ten slashes and stabs aimed at her neck and the gaps in her torso armour that failed to hit, she could give back one good hit with a hammer that would drive the enemy back out of the valley. Lilith 1 would just come bounding back, its wide maw open in a tooth grin, its cracked bone armour healing back with every step. Only a dull growl issued from its mouth, but somehow everyone could feel it, that coarse mocking laughter, utterly silent, utterly omniscient. <sighs> Something's wrong, Hans mumbled out. This is too easy. What's so easy about this? This is terrifying, replied Julius, another volunteer. So is not doing any lasting damage. All she has to do is fail her defense once. How can you kill that which refuses to die? Hans shook his head. Unit 2 can smash through mountains. Unit 1 has been known to pull whatever new power it needs out of its ass. I've seen recordings of their previous mock battles. Ikari could use Unit 1 much more intelligently than this. 
Sawyer's not doing anything more complicated than smash, because the enemy isn't doing anything more complicated than reach and stab. Angels can be cunning, but no one really expects them to be smart. That's what made Nagisa so dangerous. Han scowled and checked at the seals for his gas mask one more time. I expected reality to start breaking by now. There's something we're missing here. Lilith one ducked under Oscar's swing and jabbed with all four arms, two towards the red Ava's armpits, the lower two arms aiming to disembowel her. Oscar need, need it in the face. Then she slammed the shaft of the hammer down to break its shoulder, but Lilith one rolled back just in time to avoid the follow-through. Steam hissed out from the chimney stack-like protrusions on its back, at the same time as thick fog rolled in from the boiling sea just beyond the shoreline. What does it take to put you down? Oscar growled. What are you playing at? Lilith One's open maw rattled in a breathless laugh. Shinji screamed as his shoulder broke apart. Golden flames erupted from the wound instead of blood. Cruel laughter echoed, pulsed through the red-orange sea beneath him. He grit his teeth and pushed off the golden path that cut through the featureless expanse. She cannot kill me. The voice rolled for the deep, dim horizon. Her hammer is heavy. Her blows are weighed down by regret. Shinji winced and his tongue probed a suddenly loose tooth. Regret cannot change the nature of a man. Regret is the nature of man. Shinji wanted to argue against it, but couldn't. For all the cowardice was mocked, the fear of simply wasting time, money and effort prevented many from putting anything into their dreams. There was another word for those who dared to bet everything in the moment. Foolish gamblers. Faces drifted across the waters. An unhappy marriage. A young man watching his first love walking with another man. A father with a layabout son. A mother screaming at a daughter-in-law. A man in prison. A man who doesn't want to go to prison. A little boy unable to solve a test problem. Every moment in a person's life builds up regret. Mortals who would happily throw away the irreplaceable hours of their lives in purposeless vanities and leisures feared most of all the struggle towards futility, an empty life leading to an empty death and nothing beyond. Nothing beyond. He had to reach the end. That was the only thing he needed to do. Reach the end and win. Shed all other concerns. Just survive and claim everything. Hit and hit and hit and hit. She tries to make what is into what should not be. She is not the first to attempt to achieve enlightenment through violence. Society and traditions were powerful tools to banish regret. If you've done things for your family, for your country, for your king, for your god, at the end of your life looking back, you might feel accomplished instead of wondering about the roads untaken. But the rate of regrets would simply be laid onto other people. There was no escaping the fundamental pain of sapience. But I will take them all the same. Masato spared only a glance at the battle, with Asuka and Lilith brawling, and Mayumi in Unit 3 in Unit Zero's armour frame, milling around, feeling useless. Her fingers itched, and she had a feeling she would be chewing on a cigar right then. This is obviously a distraction. It's trying to buy time. But for what? Ritsuko spoke up with, No, we're the ones buying time. Unlike all the rest of you, I hold no special attachment to Unit 1. Masato, why haven't you ordered Asuka to do everything she can to destroy the thing yet? Angels and Evangelions all die the same way. Nothing about this feels right. Still nothing on sensors? No contacts. Both large and ground-level monitoring systems are reporting all sectors clear, Shigeru reported. Misato grit her teeth and slapped angrily at the armrest of her chair. That soundless mocking echoed in the back of her skull. Always. If it's going to give us time to activate the toy box, then I'll just say thank you, said Ritsuko. Maya, initiate. Here, yes, senpai! Alert! Status Red Omega! The metal walls all around them began to emit an ominous hum. 
Receiving situation updates from Cerberus base. All troops and equipment secured. All access points secure, Makoto reported. Capacitors at 76% capacity and rising, Shigeru added next. The tie boxes. Active? Spinning? Blinking? I don't know the word to use here. Semi-corporeal, Ritsuko corrected him. The toy box didn't have any integration to nerve systems, and no programmers could spend time making an interface. It was pure analogue, and Shigeru had to puzzle out things from a repurposed CRT monitor screwed onto his desk. He slapped at it until it behaved, and the sine waves evened out. Ritsuko nodded, satisfied. Misato, we're ready. Count it off! Attention! Attention! All secure to stations! This is the final countdown! Myra announced. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Wait! What's that? Wait, what's that whistling sound? Down! Hans screamed. Artillery! Something flashed by and the mountain face behind him exploded in a series of gut-punching booms. Hans peered up out of the trench when the echoes faded and looked towards the shoreline with his binoculars. That's... that's not artillery, he mumbled. He saw a thick, dagger-like shape pierce through the fog. A long, thin, spiny leg followed, dragging the rest of the mass out of the beach. The shape rose up into a blocky superstructure, and even from a distance it was easy to recognise the shape of massive triple-gun turrets and that distinctive pagoda mast. Serrated pincers around the hull, even as the impossibly functional turrets began to turn to reacquire targets. And once more, with 18-inch battleship cannons, roared, the flames and smoke of firing briefly obscuring the impossible shape, but the light illuminating several other impossibilities walking out from the fog behind it. Like some sort of demented giant hermit crab wearing a battleship as a home, the IJN Yamato strolled forth. Walking behind it was the battleship Bismarck. The red and black flag with a reverse swastika flew again alongside the many-beamed rising sun. All right, I guess that's a good enough reason to delay things, Hans murmured. Tokyo 3 was never designed to repel a conventional assault by military forces. And then, like a locust swarm, the skies were filled with fighters and bombers. It didn't matter they were 75 years out of date. That many bombs would be enough to flatten defenders. Tokyo 3 had missiles and heavy howitzers in abundance, but almost nothing in the way of anti-air. Lilith 1 laughed as Unit 2 and Asuka stopped their assault to blink, and then raised her AT field in reflex to block naval bombardment. Hans remembered the UNS Kringleth and Karingdol Positron beam cruisers, whose hulls were disintegrated by Nagisa's assault on Tokyo 3. He supposed it was fair that at least those proud ships were spared this terrible body jacking. Though he supposed it was probably literally not the actual ship holes out there. If the Karingdol and the Kringleth were so disrespected, unlike these testaments to terrible regimes, he would be pissed. We, we gotta fall back! Julius screamed and stepped up out of the trench. The pair of them were supposed to be just forward observers anyway. The real trenches with the overlapping fields of fire were a short distance behind them. It wasn't cowardice. He felt he had to inform the others about this immediately and help with the response. Wait, don't! There was a crack, and Julius fell down. Shot in the back. Shit! Hans spat. From out of the falling snow and the darkness behind the trees, walked out a platoon of soldiers in grey uniforms, sporting red armbands. Hans Ingram Rolfenbach was a Krieger. He checked the gas mask on his face, and mused how even this forbidding inhuman mask was more human than the blank-eyed walking corpses that faced him now. His lips pulled back into a snarl at this sheer insult to his very being. Through the radio, he could hear screaming from the command post. They're coming out of the walls! Someone yelled in panic as gunshots rippled through the channel. He raised his rifle to his shoulders and fired short, controlled bursts. It was perhaps a sign of things around Tokyo 3 that no one found it strange at all for their commander to appear to be talking to no one at all. It looked crazy as hell, but Colonel Nasuno was no spec ops soldier that had to cross the line. Someone else had crossed that line long, long ago, and this level of insanity was just candy sprinkles. Yang, what the hell is this? Is this part of the plan? 
Not really. It's interesting to be sure, but not all that unexpected either. Wild sort of plan involves literally fighting zombie magic Nazis and the Imperial Japanese Navy with their giant enemy crab battleship. It's not just zombie Nazis and crab battleships. Sectors reported in. Video screens showed alien forms lunging out of vents that should have been too small to carry them. Walls were bleeding. Isolated patrols found themselves running through an infinite series of corridors and rooms. Yang's ghostly form rippled. Reality strengthened around the control room. Nightmares are becoming real. Reality is breaking down. The AT field does more than just fix souls separately from each other. They anchor the reality that soul accepts. Seal had a plan. It was revealed that second impact was actually a failure of a controlled impact scenario. Gendo Akari had a plan. Obstinately, it was to prevent third impact by the angels coming into contact with their progenitor and reshaping the world to suit their desires by holding them away long enough for Seal to initiate third impact by their own terms. What he actually wanted was to waste everyone's time long enough to get out of this reality because he himself had already lived through a different third impact scenario. And make no mistake, a controlled third impact could probably fix the world. Time and space will cease to hold meaning. Is that Captain Saragi's plan? No. Even if that could work, to do so without the world's consent would be a crime equal to Nogis's attempt at his coercive public health measure. Captain plan is simple. We cannot defeat the Angels or Lilith with what we have now. We have no time, so we must make time. So, what do we do? Why do we have all this? We can't just ignore them as delusions. People are dying out there. Fear and hate. Terror and spite made manifest. That is what Lilith is, because we are all born screaming in fear and pain. I arranged for my own assassination so that my soul could be captured and used as a catalyst for defence here on the other side, while my people used that excuse for their own internal initiatives. As a person, I didn't have much more to live for, but in death, surprisingly, there was much more that I could do. If I am able to manifest openly as a ghost, now that the walls of reality have weakened, the idea that the Great Devourer could bring back the pain-filled ghosts of everybody that's ever died in war, is it really that hard to accept? But we're not scaled of fighting ghost Nazis and imperialists. This is as guilt-free shooting as it can get. But neither do you have infinite ammunition. The point is not to win by breaching the geofront. We're not talking here the actual souls of the dead, not like me, but the shadows of shadows imprinted upon the sky of human history. Darkness to light. Echoes to swallow the sound of meaning. Everyone that dies here is a soul taken away from Ikari's own plan to save us all. We are vanguards of history, my friend. We cannot so simply kill our own past to make our future. Misato looked towards Ritzko and asked again, But why ghost Nazis? Ritzko groaned and rubbed at the bridge of her nose. Look, we've known about the quantifiable existence of souls for quite a while now. How to capture it, how to split it. Vice Commander Futsuki taught metaphysical biology at Kyoto University. Angels themselves have proved that souls can arbitrarily define their material bodies. All human beings derived from Lilith were technically the 18th angel, composed of a colony of flawed and separate entities that are nonetheless connected to each other once we shed our forms bound in LCL. And humanity hates itself. These enemies we now face remain in popular consciousness as the last unambiguously bad guys in the last good war. But for all the evils they did... They were all still too human. Our sins always return to us. She licked her lips. But it's too late. We're almost done. Our system's fully charged! Maya reported. Ritzko nodded. Initiated your command, Masado. Katsuragi Masado stared up at the main screen, showing an overhead map view of the battle space. Smaller windows showed camera views of various fights in and around the Hakone area. Unit 2 was still locked in combat with Lilith 1. She bit her lips. It would be the last she'd see of old familiar Japan for a long time.
Blue panic detected! Maya interjected suddenly. But we already have... Wait, what? Another window opened, showing the coastline. Pinkish flesh and spines and pulsating breathing tubes erupted from the surface of the waters. A needle-like protrusion on its prow opened out like a blossoming flower, exposing delicate-looking fronds of bone and chitin. If it was another angel, it was a massive one, larger than anything they'd ever seen before. It's an island, Maya gasped. A monster island! The open maw of the creature began to glow. Punch it! Punch it! Punch it! Punch it! Misato yelled. As a deep thrumming note spread through the geofront, Lilith One perked up from its crouch. Oscar's jaw clacked up against her skull as the bone-crusted Ava suddenly rushed at her, slamming her into the mountainside. She blocked the upper pair of bone swords with the shaft of her hammer, but the lower pair simply stabbed her into the slope under her armpits. Lilith never had any intention of killing her at all. Such a pose was oddly intimate, almost as if she were laid onto her wedding bed. Don't play around with me, damn it! she hissed. Not again. She was the world's last hope, but even this monster was telling her she was no more than second best. Not again! Lilith's form laughed. Particle beam fire splashed off its back. Unit 3 and Mayumi Hamagishi in it were screaming somewhat indistinct. Then Unit 1 reared back and slammed its forehead into Unit 2. Wham! The screens inside the entry plug flickered. Wham! They buzzed. Wham! They turned static. Wham! They turned reflective. Asuka saw, for a moment, that instead of savage rage, the expression on her face there was a look of anguish. And then her reflection grinned. It stood up and leaned out of the screen. It reached out and clasped red-gloved hands against her cheeks. Asuka was paralysed, not with terror, not with shame, but from the strange, cool relief flowing out from her heart. Your AT field is strong. Too strong, said a doppelganger. She slid out of the screen and langu languorously draped herself over herself. That's because you're so scared to get attached again. You love them and it didn't mean a thing. They left you one by one and now you are alone. Oscar's gaze firmed. Slowly she hissed out. You! The other Oscar laughed. I will take you home. Oscar grimaced, and with supreme effort of will, let go of the control sticks for her Ava and punched her own face. It wasn't as strong as it could be, because the entry plug was filled with LCL for interfacing and impact resistance. Lily threw her head back and laughed harder, and from Oscar's point of view, the only thing she could see was her own chin, her nose and bared teeth. And then Lilith suddenly stopped. Time to eat. She lunged down and chomped onto Asuka's neck, at the same time as Unit 1 bit down on Unit 2. Blood spurted out, and then there was only time for screaming. Shinji began to vomit and spit. Fresh red blood dripped out from his jaws like a little waterfall. And then he could only scream. Hans bit back a scream as he dragged Julius' body down into the trench. The other UN soldier was still alive, but groaning with pain. Modern body armour mainly protected the front, but the back still had enough Kevlar layers. He thumbed his radio again and got nothing but static in return. Damn it, man. What did you go and do that for? Shit, I'm sorry, man, Julius replied. Did you, did you just kill a whole lot of fucking Nazis? Hans stared back silently. What the fuck is even happening now? I blame you for this, you know. Mortar fire began raining down around them. Things had become a little bit too exciting instead of the moaning earlier about how they were unable to contribute to the fight between gods. Sometimes when you bitch about things the gods, they listen. Fair enough, Hans replied. Wait, is that a fucking Panzer free jumping around on spider legs? The literal spider tank leaped over the trench, then stopped. It had noticed there were people inside. It turned back and began to approach, wiggling happily from side to side. Its main gun bobbed up and down, and the hull-mounted machine gun began to whirl about in limitation of mandibles. This is a nightmare, Julius moaned. They're robbing us of even dying with any dignity. 
Dead is dead, Hans replied. Dignity has nothing to do with it. There was a Carl Gustav recoilless rifle, and it would actually work against the quite thin armour of the thing, but it was way over there to the left. Julius laughed weakly and raised his rifle as he lay down on his back. Go on then, I'll keep it distracted. Hans snarled. No! He didn't go so far to save his friend from his own idiocy just to see him die here. But even as he raged internally in defiance, he could see no way out. Nerve Branch Nevada vanished under the Dirac Sea, blamed on the angels. Nerve China and Nerve Russia were casualties of Nagisa's near unstoppable rampage across most of continental Europe. Only Nerve Boston remained completely intact as a nerve site. No one could ever really say anymore that working for Nerve was safe. Monsters stalked their darkened halls. But it was in fucking America, and the city outside was oddly well equipped to suddenly being attacked by ghost Nazis. At least until ghost confederates started appearing indoors. Shinji was drowning. He fell off the golden path and the cold infinite LCLC pulled him down. A billion billion hands weighed down his soul. Whatever amount of power, whatever soul fire, could only be absorbed by the infinite hungers of the immaterial sea of souls. He glimpsed in the shadows of the deep the bones of something unimaginable. Even Lilith was a fraction of a soul, a splinter of something greater. The first soul that shattered itself on boarding the seed of life to be reincarnated all through the dead universe. But that was completely unimportant. No! He tried to gurgle out. He struggled, but heavier and heavier were the invisible chains even as he drew strength from them. It was tempting him just to let go and spread his consciousness out, lose the last remaining lock to his physical form and fight Lilith on its own terms. The Sea of Souls hungered to be commanded, for the dead to once more feel anything, to rise up and share with the living the pain of non-existence. Gods boiled in the dark, wishing to be born, personas asking to be put on. In the end, a man, no matter how powerful, cannot save the world alone. But that was all right too. Because a hand reached down, grabbed around his wrist, the contact bringing back warmth and life, and pulled him back up and out of the golden sea. Other hands helped, and the young man crawled back into the golden path, retching and spitting out LCL, and taking in desperate gasps of metaphorical air. He looked up and beheld four smiling figures. He blinked. The first one wore black robes and a long black beard and yarmulke. He looked every bit the Jewish or vaguely Middle Eastern slash Orthodox elder. Then beside him sat someone dressed in Catholic priestly robes with a short white beard and jolly expression. And then just as stereotypically dressed and vaguely multiracial in features was someone in the bright orange robes of a Buddhist monk. And the last was dressed in a turtleneck suit, a nearly trimmed goatee and a shining bald head. He was grinning amiably. Shinji blinked again. You are not Lenin. You are expecting maybe Kane, but it was I, Joku Kan, spoke humanity's representation of post postmodernist cultural imperatives. The two UN soldiers tensed and ready to roll away to opposite sides as the Nazi spider tank approached. And then they stopped. They watched a Carl Gustav apparently rise up on its own and take aim at the ghost tank. The spider tank noticed and gave out an odd chirp. It spun about and began to shoot at the hovering recoilless rifle with its machine gun. Predictably, its bullets only hit thin air. Before any bullet could accidentally hit it, the 84mm infantry light anti-tank weapon fired and the spider tank blew up with a screech of pain. What? That was all Hans could say. For a moment there he could see a shimmering figure, a slim middle-aged Japanese man in a suit with large sunglasses. For some unknown reason, he could recognise this was Agent Jiro of Nerve Section 2. The Carl Gustav dropped, clattering back onto the damp snowy trench. Hans began cackling. When the dead come out to slay the living, whoever said that ghosts can't fight other ghosts? When the gates of hell open, it wasn't just the dead who died in dishonour that would rise again. Boom! Boom! Everyone could only whimper and crawl deeper onto the back wall as they watched the shelter doors bend inwards. Then finally the metal gave way, tearing open as a long bone claw punched through. Something monstrous roared behind the door. A normal human arm pushed through the gap and threw a grenade into the room. 
Sophia Africopolis could only close her eyes and hug her child closer, protecting him with her own body just so he could live that little bit longer. Foom! A glowing gold boot slammed on top of the grenade as it rolled towards the crying civilians, exploding it uselessly. The shelter wasn't very big, but the doors the height of the walls were roomy enough to hold three Terminator armoured figures. They raised their bolt guns to the door, and the sound of their bolter fire echoed painfully through the shelter. The bolts punched through the doors, and blew apart whatever horrors were on the other side. Some f Sophia looked up and gasped. Her son shouted out in recognition, Father! One of the three glowing figures raised his hands in a thumbs-up gesture. There is no death, he said through his vox, then softly vanished into golden dust, blown away by an unseen wind. Someone inside Nerve Boston found a strange shield with a white star roundel. In desperation, he threw the shield. It bounced off the first undead soldier, and the spectral form dissipated. It bounced from that into the next three on the firing line behind that one, off the wall, and then into the group just entering the room, and then back towards the person that held it. Dr. Thompson looked down at the shield in his hands. One of his co-workers mused, Oh, I guess you're Captain America now. But I'm ready, he weakly protested. As so was Steve Rogers before the super soldier serum, was the response. This is clearly important for us to start researching. We were expecting maybe your four fantastic friends, yes? Spoke the figure wearing the orange-yellow robes. But they are representations of your shattered psyche. We're the ones who speak for humanity's own ingrained neurosis. We do not represent religions, said the one with the black robes. We represent certain traditions, cultural forces. For example, I am not Judaism or Islamic thought, but in general terms the influence of the Middle East on human history. So it would be fine to refer to me as the Elder. And I do not represent Christianity, but in general the Western school of thought and cultural expectations. You could call me the father. And I'm not Buddhism or the Vedic traditions, but though, of course, there is some overlap. I represent broadly the Far East or Asian traditions. You could call me the sage. Shinji looked towards the exuberant bald man. There was something oddly charismatic about his barely repressed glee, even when just standing still. And you're not atheism or the political dialect, I suppose. That's correct, my child. I represent a rejection of traditional forms and a creation of new ones. You may call me the brother. Shinji frowned minutely for a moment. Wait, what about Africa and South America and all those other pagan traditions? Oh, that goes into my portfolio too, said the brother. The modern world is much more tribal and open to worship of idols than you might believe. Shinji looked askance. I guess? So you can also go ahead and call me the Meme Lord, my child. Fury and flame, we are one. The father groaned and palmed his face. Stop! Shinji stared at each of them and touched the raw flesh of his own shoulder. Small flickers of bright yellow flame erupted from the wound, even as it stitched itself back together. All right, so why are you here? Are you here to help? The father answered. Do you know what is happening out there? We are in a war not of bullets, but of minds. Not of weapons, but of ideas. Not of bombs and cannons, but of souls. But war is what humans know best. And when all you have is a hammer, all things start to look like nails. How do you kill an idea except by ideas of your own? The sage nodded gently and said to Shinji, We are here because humanity is technically one organism. The barriers are breaking. The anti ag field is spreading. The chamber of Galf stands empty, but there are two places where loose souls may go. Back into Lilith, or to you? Shinji nodded. I can feel it. The elder said, But do you recall the problem of becoming a god? The greater the divinity, the less able you will become at interacting with the material world. Something all-powerful in the realms of imagination is more or less irrelevant in the mortal reality. That is why prophets exist, and why miracles are supposed to be rare. The sage added, Even gods are not immune to the cycle of karma, but even a divine realm is but a dream in the sleep of something greater. 
The Buddha sees that all things are but an illusion, and no physics and simple common sense refuse the unreality of things. The nature of reality is actually malleable by a strong enough soul. The absolute terror field is a rejection of the outside to create your own perfectly safe world inside. Lilim, human beings, only have the ability to make these shells of mortality that separate individuals from each other. Seal wanted a world of perfect understanding, without change, without fear. Let the gods remain dreaming. Let dreamers dream within their dream. Ah, oh, my child, this crazy moon eye plan is death. But at least it is not the final reductive death of Lilith awakening to recycle souls, said the brother. Humanity is Lilith, and Lilith is humanity. She's our dark side, our self hatred, our wish to become new again and forget everything. Oh, did you think this is the first time, and we fought against the injustice of an uncaring universe? There must be a better way. When a cycle repeats itself again and again, it may require an external factor to alter the repeating variables, said the sage. The Buddha seeks to go beyond the great will of Dharma and into Nirvana, and so some tired souls simply long for an end to things. We are all each of us little gods, waiting to become all-powerful. The difference is that in actuality, only collectively can we reach that state. But if you think about it, how can you be sure we're not dreaming this right now? Have you seen all the insane things our young friend has seen happen in his wake? He was already influencing the material world just by existing. What if we're already in a preferred impact scenario, and changes are reverberating downwards back through history? The elder hummed and tugged at his own long beard. I find your theories interesting and would like to subscribe to your newsletter. The father raised both hands. We will have none of that matrix nonsense in this here mindscape. That was Seal's plan, and they failed, and we're all mature people here and must only deal with hard facts. None of us have the good sense of a five-year-old child, the sage helpfully pointed out. Humanity as a whole is kind of dumb. Individuals are smart. People are dumb, panicky animals, and you know it. The brother grinned again. We're helping! Shinji stared down at the proof that humanity was insane, and yes, it made perfect sense why they'd choose him as their new god. Then he winced as his chest was punched through. Blood and flame erupted out of his chest. The, the brother reached over and put a comforting hand on the boy's shoulder. Oh, my child, you can't die here. You can't kill the messiah. Messiah! you! Mayumi screamed as Unit 2 fell down, limp and poisoned. Inhumanely accurate super-heavy battleship shells slammed into her, but against her thousand layers of armour and seventy metres of machine god, they failed to even budge her at all. She could only stare transfixed, as if prey paralysed by the sight of a predator. Now she was alone in an Evangelion designed for long-distance combat, against the Evangelion that had personally gone to rip and tear everything that dared stand in its path. She was going to die. Tears were welling up in her eyes. This was how she was going to die, just holding the line in some futile gesture of defiance. She was not okay with that. You. You monster! She screamed and raised her twin-linked positron cannons. Da! 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 Lilith One didn't even bother raising its AT field. With sinuous grace, it simply bent away from the bean and then pounced at her like a cat at play. The two machine gods slammed together and claws dug into her armour. Unit One's fanged maw screamed at her face. Mayumi screamed back in raw terror. The heavy cannons dropped away from her arms, and in her hands were as unto chainsaws. But before she could even attempt to carve into the armour bone ribs of the enemy Evangelion, it snapped its jaws around her Ava's head in a twisted parody of a kiss and bit through the armour. It tore away the faceplate, exposing her Evangelion's real face beneath. Lilith One raised a clawed finger up to its own neck and tore open its throat, bleeding caustic blood onto Unit Three's face. The cybernetic implants began to smoke and dissolve, sending scalding acid blood and metal down the blue Ava's mouth. Mayumi tasted blood going down her throat. She couldn't even scream anymore. I accept you to. A voice echoing with a billion mouths whispered to her ears. And then she was speared through. By a long-tipped bident. It was the lance of Longinus. The lance went into U Lilith One's back, puncturing her spine, out through her chest and then into Unit 3. The spear just barely missed the core. 
She could only gurgle, seeing beyond the monster on her chest a glowing angelic figure with eight broad white glowing rings. And then there was only darkness. Because an impossibly vast shape had obscured the sun, Lilith had realised what Katsuragi was planning and decided that she should retain overwhelming power at ground zero. At the same time, in the Geofront and Nerve's deepest buried medical centre, Ayanami Rei raised, looked up from her silent vigil over Shinji Kari's comatose form. Without looking back, she asked, Why do you betray him? This is a contingency he set up long before. Only by completing the scenario can we save everyone. We can go back. Everything can be made right again. You mean to kill him? Do you not know gratitude? Do you wish to make all that you sacrificed all for nothing? Ray turned around, and standing there was autumn joy of the Saikana. In following Shinji's calls to arms, their entire combat form, form was basically annihilated. Ray was not a person who could express sympathy for their loss. She was the fifth, not the second who learned how to become a real girl, nor the third who fell in love and gave her everything, or the fourth who failed and became a vessel for Lilith. That emotion lingered in her, but muted, replaced only with a terrible purpose. The silence in the room quivered with her barely suppressed AT field. I protect him. Ray stared at him with glowing red eyes. All those who threaten his life will die. Autumn Joy, last of the elder psychomonks of Javal, sighed. You are a girl who could calmly walk a life of explosions. We respect that faith. He opened his eyes and his irises glowed with a purple light. But we too have our faith. From our beginnings, we were made to be the god slayers. The air behind her broke apart, and a silver-armoured figure stabbed down with his crackled wraith-bone blade. Abruptly, everything around the bed was flat and flushed to the walls, but a Psychana knight in his blade was unperturbed by the AT field's telekinetic slam. Ray just barely bl managed to place her hand over the blade. Her blood dripped onto Shinji's chest, but she managed to stop it. Psychic power bypassed the AT field. It could kill her. Ray smiled slightly. Did she love him? Her memories of the third and fourth were like a cloying mist in her mind, but at least she could feel a deep and abiding affection. It was comfortable simply to be in his presence. It was comforting to know that she might be allowed to simply sit beside saw you later. She wasn't their best friend and beloved, not anymore, but there was always the room for more. There was always the promise to be more. But all of that was contingent on all of them living to be together after all of this. Ray scowled minutely. Between her palm and the bedsheet, trails of golden lightning sparked. Second, give me your strength. Third, give me your will. Fourth, give me your lack of limits. Ray closed her hand and shattered the blade. And from the speakers outside the hallway came the words. Three. Two. Autumn sighed again. It is too late. One. Ignition. The world seemed to flicker for a moment. A previously filled bedsheet collapsed onto an empty bed. Ray screamed, No! Two blood fountains then painted the walls. The two died without regrets, except for the knowledge that they failed to allow the easier, cleaner path. Toy box! Temporary objective yoke! Boundary Obliterator Zero! Akagi Transtemporal Drive! Activating! And then, with a quake and a bright flash of light, Tokyo 3 disappeared off the map. Nerve and all of Tokyo 3 had vanished into space and time. They took with them Lilith, the great enemy, and the only way for the angels to trigger their third impact. Humanity stopped randomly exploding into LCL, and nightmares stopped coming out of the shadows. What had been once the chilly mountain valley of Hakone was replaced with tan desert sands. And in the centre of it, a young boy dressed in a hospital gown fell down to the ground. They left Shinji Akari behind. The return dead coming from out from the seas was the JSSDF's problem now. They could only hope the living dead were actually just philosophical zombies instead of infecting zombies. Other nerve branches began to light up with blue patterns. Angels were waking up. Dozens of them. Hundreds of them. All of them. 
that should have been the end of things. They'd struggled and found victory in coming together in the middle of a crisis. But that was not how the world worked. Two years later, Nerve and Tokyo Free reappeared in the sands of the Great Desert, a circle of green in the middle of nothing but heat and lifeless wastes. The PLA had zeroed into the area with every bit of artillery and N2 devices they could build in the meantime. Megaton range N2 bombs rained down. They would have done that anyway if there wasn't this monster island in the way. Tokyo Free appeared in expectation of being helped, and met only bitter spite. It was well deserved. People stopped dying. That was the natural result of what Nerve did by taking Ray Lilith, source of all life, after she'd emptied the Chamber of Galf. People were just souls that were clad in bodies made of LCL. They were terrified when Lilith robbed them all of the ability to fall asleep. They were terrified when whole cities were depopulated, running orange with LCL, people dying senselessly and for no reason. Now, for two years instead, no matter what damage, no matter what pain, people could no longer be released from their bonds of flesh. People could no longer die from hunger or disease, and now were terrified of taking any damage. They had some regeneration, but even physical immortality was slow and agonising. Their bodies could only ever really heal at the normal human rate. Now not even death could spare them from the agony of being shot and stabbed. Lawlessness became rampant, while government forces had stronger hands in their monopoly of force. Both could happen at the same time, because while public order was maintained, all sins brooked in the shadows. Humanity was terrified of death and craved immortality, until it was given to them. The only thing worse than the apocalyptic terror of death was the apocalyptic terror of living. It was a world of the literal living dead. And the angels roamed the world, listless and unstoppable, and though they weren't aggressive, there was nothing that could be done to stop them from walking where they wished. They were searching for something completely beyond their reach. The angels were the first and true immortals, and eventually even the fear of them faded. In desperation, they were attacked, and it was found that only in the boundaries of their AT field, angels could bring true death. But provoking them was easier than it sounded, because literally nothing that didn't possess its own potent AT field would be recognised as any real threat. How ironic, the terror of the alien simply faded away once the alien achieved total overwhelming dominance. Enough to make all of humanity extinct simply through manual destruction, city by city, town by town. It was only Lilith, the hungry shadow of all humanity, the great mother that devours her young, that could spread the anti-AT field. These were the unforeseen consequences of Katsuragi's plan. Ritsuko Akagi, despite her newfound glorious madness, was still rooted in science and machinery, didn't quite appreciate just how conceptual was now the war they were fighting. They fled to give the world time to adapt. The world was made to adapt into a world of cursed immortality. Time skipped. Everything changed when Tokyo 3 stopped being attacked. Nerve had disappeared to save them all, but many believed they'd been abandoned, that Nerve had decided to just fuck off to another planet or something. The plan was to bait the enemy and then abscond with them into timeless space to give the world years again to prepare, but Second Impact halved the human population. What had been 6 billion became 3, and in 15 years only returned to about 4 billion. Then, two years ago, that figure was halved again. Whole cities and populations were annihilated, but fortunately only the people were gone. The infrastructure remained intact. Kataragi's plan was fuss. 1. Using the toy box temporal drive, Nerve Tokyo 3 will vanish and reappear in a predetermined point in the Gobi Desert where they could all fight with abandon. There they would resupply, rearm and vanish again. They would then reappear in the Nevada Desert to fight in coordination with Nerve forces in America. Then they would vanish again to reappear home in the Hakone Valley region. Where the other nerve branches, lacking functional evangelions, were helpless against their host countries, their personnel and research scattered to the winds. It was a great, if inevitable, betrayal. Since the awakened angels didn't go on a rampage as before, while Nerve Tokyo 3 was vanished into time, it was proven the only reason they ever attacked was because of Nerve in the first place. Now the world had collectively decided they were better off without Nerve and all evangelions. Karen Nagisa watched the scene from his orbital station and laughed. So, they're back. It's amazing how things could change in just two years. This is no longer the world that you know. 
In the end, it wasn't really faith that drew people to you, but the rule of terror, the lack of any real alternative. Without the awe to remind them all, there is only resentment at being reminded of their powerlessness. The last thing that remained in Pandora's box, after releasing all the evils of the world, was hope. But they were silly enough to take that box with them. Nagisa had two years of absolute dominance over the planet. He was as much baffled by the apparent stupidity of leaving him with no opposition, but in some odd way, he was touched that even Ikari seemed to trust he would at least not risk humanity's extinction. Due to the curse of their immortality without regeneration, many flocked and even prayed to him for deliverance. He, who had once waged war on all the world and almost run it, became their last hope. They cried out, Save us! He looked down on them all and softly whispered, No. As you say, sir, we could have done more in these past two years. We are the only ones capable of building true Evangelion-class battlers, after all, said Sarah. In every way we have been very merciful, but seeing these humans still betraying their own greatest defenders, they are scum in every sense of the word. Conquering them means nothing. Why would I want to rule over ants? I have all of you, and that's enough for me. I no longer hold humanity in any special regard, but as long as Lilith exists, even we won the edge of extinction at any moment. They have prepared as much as it was possible. We have prepared and supped the full measure of our godhood. We know where they are keeping him, sir, so why don't we just kill him, rescue him? A measure of control would not be out of place, even if you want that final climactic battle, right? No, I respect the fool, but he is a fool. Let him suffer the betrayal of the people he sacrificed so much to protect. So much to everyone's surprise, he didn't go on a conquering spree as the only person now with the ability to create Ava class battlers. The angels were sessile and less provoked, and if he showed up down there, they'd become aggressive in their pursuit again. Instead, he'd send people to kidnap communities now and then, and though they all painted him a genetic monster, none of them could do anything to stop him. He was a lonely god. He still laughed at the foolishness of mortals. He rammed the planetoid. Two! At Lilith. Did they really think some clean antimatter bombs would be enough? In her long absence, now humanity was so willing to embrace death herself. But if she could be killed, if they all could be killed, if they could all be just released back into the screaming dark, the world would be better off without that terrible accursed power. The firestorm and the overpressure zone could conceivably damage Tokyo 3 beneath the behemoth. But then he saw a red field extend out from underneath the hovering monster island. He laughed and clapped, and behind him his lawyer adjutant frowned. They still resented how much affection he had for his enemies, and it had always been strange how that was mutual, despite trying their damnedest to kill each other. Even poisoned, even with her blood spontaneously combusting, Oscar Langley saw you just refuse to sit down and die. And that was when Shinji Ikari finally woke up and discovered he was strapped to an operating table with half his flesh flayed open. 